welcome to the New Year's edition of the Wanderfunk Podcast. I am Alex Rosa, and with me, as always, is the wonderful James Debney out of Sydney, Australia. G'day, guys. Today's episode, uh, we're going to be talking about the year that has happened and set our sights on what we can expect for 2020. So... Uh, James, are you typically one to do uh, New Year's resolutions? Uh, not really ever done like New Year's resolutions, let's, let's be honest. Like, it's always those things where you go into it and it's like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it's sort of like, you're just setting your sights way too high. So that's always been my sort of feeling. If, if you're going to do it, you've got to be reasonable and be like, I'm, you can't just go in and be like, I'm going to get a new job that pays $300,000 a year. And, you know, it's like, dude. Come on now, like be reasonable. If you're doing like little things, I think actually this year, me and my girlfriend were sort of like, it's not really a resolution, but it's sort of like, hey, in the new year, we're going to start a like sort of try and get a little bit fit. So we'll like go for some runs and stuff and maybe lose a little bit of weight. Is it a new year's resolution? Like sort of, not really, but that's about as, as close as I think we've gotten to it or I've gotten to it. But what about you? Do you bother or? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I will say this, uh, for me, I'm a, personally, I'm a huge fan of the new year. Um, as far as holidays go for me, it makes the new year makes the most sense because you kind of take the time to reflect on the things that you've done. And the new year always brings about the idea that like, because of the things you've done, you should now sort of think about a new course of going about uh you know the next steps in your life right like obviously nobody's life is sort of outlined around um you know yearly increments as far as success right like nobody's looking from january 1st to january 1st to achieve like bigger goals but i mean like for example at the beginning of 2018 so now almost two years back uh my goal at the time was just to get out and travel yeah Um, and thankfully um you know i i did my time as a bartender um morristown and then from there um i you know started doing just that you know saved up my cash started kind of slowly moving out into the world going you know seeing london again seeing lisbon again you know getting out there circumstances it was there to keep my long-term relationship with my wonderful girlfriend intact. But, you know, regardless of the motivation to do it, um, you know, I kind of fulfilled my resolution, which was simply the desire to kind of keep things from staying monotonous and go out into the world and travel and see it again as I'd been seeing it um, previously. I kind of got stuck back home and I didn't want that to be the case for the following year. So then, thankfully, um, as I started getting back out there uh, at the beginning of 2019, once my girlfriend and I decided that we were going to commit ourselves to traveling, we set out in March of 2019 uh, to explore Southeast Asia. We did that for eight months. Yeah. Um, so while resolutions may seem a little hacky, I think it's never a bad thing to give yourself a goal um in general whether it happens within the year whether it happens later i think uh taking inventory of what you've been able to achieve thus far and then choose to go beyond that um can at the very least kind of give you a direction uh especially in in the world that we're going through now where like you can do anything and everything in an even moment, but when do you pull the trigger? How do you pull the trigger? What are the reasons behind you pulling that trigger uh, to go and get something done? And I think that uh, all in all, it, it's a very valuable, it's a very valuable proposition to be goal oriented. And I think um, that's, beyond that. Yeah. That's something I've had similar coming, like getting older and realizing more, about like self-reflection and like life goals type things so sort of like new year's and not so much for like a new year's resolution and that sort of like cheesy side of things that you could consider but more like a self-actualization which is also a bit of a 
it's a bit of a buzzword and a bit of a wanky word, but it's sort of looking back at a year and going like, all right, what did I do well? What did I do badly? How can I try and replicate or do better? So sort of actually like you know, self-reflection, obviously, and then going, how do I get better at either life or work or whatever it is that you're achieving or wanting to achieve? And then making those sort of your targets for the year. And I know quite a few people, maybe not quite a few people, but some people do sort of like quarterly reviews of that, a sort of like self-reflection and look back for the quarter and see, you know, did I achieve my financial targets? Did I achieve my targets at work? Did I achieve my targets in my relationship? So it's not just like, you know, work-based things and money-based things. It's sort of a bit of personal achievement in some cases. You know, there's times where I think I've looked back and I've sort of gone, oh shit, I just noticed in myself that when I get angry, I sort of start making like arguments up of like how I how this person's going to say something to me. And then my response to that, like it's sort of just overthinking things in my head. And I noticed that in myself and I was like, oh shit, I'm actually quite proud of myself for noticing that. And now whenever I sort of start doing it, it's like, hold on a second. I'm just a bit annoyed. This is never going to be the way it's going to go because of course things never go how you think it's going to go because other people are, you know, different and think differently to you. But that sort of gave me that self-reflection of being like, all right, I'm really happy with that. That's a positive thing for me and a positive step. And now I can take that and use that in my life going forward. And that works for relationships. It works for, you know, personal relationships with girlfriends, family, it works for work. It works for sports, if you play sports, whatever else it is. So that was one of the things that's sort of like, okay, not quite at New Year's, but like, hey, that's sort of a good self actualization which you could sort of call the same thing as like a New Year's resolution, really. Yeah, I mean, like, you I mean, you know what it is? It's, it's, you know, we put a lot of pressure on the holiday because it's the beginning of a new year. But like, you know, in reality, you know, if you make your resolution, you know, on May 12th, it's the same intention. Right? Exactly. It, it's about taking the time and as you were saying it's taking the time to assess the things that you've done weighing them a thing against the things that you want to do and have done and then seeing how close or far away you are from getting those things done yeah. um and i think that you know again it's you know we we can scoff at the new year's resolution because it's very typically a lot of people have very lofty goals for what yeah. they expect in the new year and things and from there, like, yeah, it's fine. But it's not to say that those lofty goals aren't worth it. It's simply to say that the pressure that you put around getting them done within the frame of reference of just a holiday is no more more or less valuable than just setting those goals for yourself at any point in the year. Um, and I think that one of the good points that you brought up was talking about, you know, you, you can't really set a goal or a resolution, as it were, unless you take the time to analyze kind of where you've been. So in that spirit, I think that, you know, we, we, we're a podcast that focuses on travel and the ability to experience the world. I think that because 2019 has easily been one of the most I mean, I guess chaotic years, honestly. Yeah. Tumultuous, um, different, wow. Tumultuous to say yeah. the least. Um, you know, in the States, now with the uh, the Conservative Party taking over the parliament in the UK, mm. uh, you're looking at a lot of, you know, right wing, like hard right wing activism popping up internationally. Um, it's been honestly it's been a very tough year for travel like you know especially as an american you know people look to the idea of traveling as the ability to escape and the ability to sort of do something bigger and better than they could do at home and i find that with a lot of my friends um their motivation to get out and go do something outside of the u.s has been honestly a bit encumbered uh, by the fact that the world outside feels and seems a lot scarier than it used to. Um, you know, part of it is our ability to know more about what's going out, you know, going on in the outside world. That's so much. But, 
Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, like, I mean, even taking Australia, for instance, you know, literally your backyard, like where, you know, we once thought of Australia as, you know, throwing a shrimp on the barbie and, you know, having a good time with, you know, what we would imagine would be like minded, uh, let's say, festive individuals, because <laughs> Australians do have a reputation to, uh, you know, want to get down. <laughs> Enjoyable but times. yeah, now, exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, having a casual, laid-back time, wearing your flip-flops, going to the beach, surfing. Wearing your thongs. Now, because of everything that's going on in Australia, specifically it being on fire, um, I, I'm not that... It's not too hard to imagine why people who were previously keen on traveling to Australia might be a bit deterred um, because they don't necessarily have a proper understanding of what the impacts of the fires are or, um, you know, what, what the actual literal landscape is yeah. for them to have a nice and comfortable time there. Yeah. And I feel like it can kind of serve as a pretty accurate metaphor for kind of how, especially for Americans, how they may see the rest of the world like you know while there may or may not be literal fires going on with boris johnson in office in the uk it may feel like the country is literally on fire so why take the time to go and explore an adventure mm. right yeah i suppose that's the sort of the difference that you'd find like especially between things that are sort of i'm sort of trying to think of how i want to like word this but in countries like the US and the UK and uh, Australia, like, you know, and obviously Canada and other, like, large westernization, westernized nations Canada doesn't as well. really count. They're, it's always a happy, <laughs> it's a Willy Wonka factory of socialism. No worries there. Uh, <laughs> hi, hi, Canadians from down here. I know we do have a few, actually. Um, that's, uh, hope you're going well, guys. Um, but, like, I was thinking, for those countries, the... A lot of it, like, you're talking about, like, the Boris Johnson and the political climate there, like, yeah, like, Brexit's having its effect and, you know, whether or not people support it is their decision. But if you're there as a traveller, like, your being there has nothing to do with their Brexit. Like, if you're not going there, then you're not supporting their tourism industry. And we've sort of discussed this, I think, a little bit other times. And it's sort of, it's not quite as much in like these large westernized nations as well, because they're such developed nations, the tourism industry is always supported because there's always going to be people that want to go there. You know, there's always people that want to go to New York and Los Angeles and London and Sydney and Melbourne. So it's sort of not such a a hard drop off. That is a good point. But what I think is something that uh, we have to kind of consider is that like, without having to think of yourself as a traveler that has to have an impact on the local environment, I think for a lot of people, the way that they kind of see it is that in a tumultuous environment, it's not quite safe or apropos, if you will. Um, Hashtag bougie. um, To kind of literal like literally and physically insert yourself into a tumultuous environment and I, and I you know we talked about you know the UK and there are the protests that are going on and things like that but I mean I think the perfect example especially for 2019 is what's going on in Hong Kong mm. um you know where it's you know obviously the people of Hong Kong are in a position that they don't want to be in, but they're doing their best to try to create a better position for themselves. And in doing so, their protests, you know, they blocked off, you know, the airport for a couple of days during some of their protests. They're literally taking up the streets um, and, you know, taking up, you know, traffic and things. Like, as a traveler, even if you just want to remain on the outside, when it comes to political positions that are genuinely impacting your experience while you're where you know in these locales you know it it's tough to be motivated 
to go to Hong Kong when you think that maybe the trains aren't going to run. Maybe, you know, um, maybe my flight in is going to be, you yeah, know, uh, on the I have to have yeah. some sort of detour to somewhere else. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's more than just sort of being a part of it. I mean, we, in the pilot episode, you know, we talked about my involvement in the protests in Romania, but like, my involvement was the same involvement as any given citizen there. But in the bigger picture, you know, we don't necessarily have the numbers of it, but because of the continuous protests that went on in Bucharest, how much did their tourism industry suffer mm. by essentially scaring off possible, you know, investors or contributors to their local economy? Yeah, and you'll never um, be able to find those numbers either. They're not like no replicable right. numbers because it's sort of one thing of like well is the tourist season being affected by it or is a lower tourist se- tourism season like we don't know but right. there could be a correlation there it'd be an interesting I to mean, see if honestly, you could do a study or someone it's the same it's the same as you trying to find the numbers of girls that would be interested in you after a new haircut yeah maybe like yeah it could go it'd up be interesting it could go to find down, out. but you would never know it's <laughs> you know wh- while it is I would say difficult to try to have a very real understanding of what's going on domestically in a country that you're not in. Mm. I think the biggest consequence isn't so much, um, it isn't so much trying to understand the complexities of the arguments because those typically get put out either by propaganda machines or you know, uh, or by, you know, meaningful users online. So you can look at Reddit where people have like conversations that kind of bring a lot more variables to the table. But I think the biggest consequence is really comes down to whether, whether you're from the U S the UK, somewhere in Europe or whatever, the limitations on the amount of information that you get, while you might be getting all of the quote unquote facts, depending on your own country's position, it's very, very likely that that position will be filtered through a lens that either your country supports or the network needs to use to get ratings or it's no longer through an unbiased lens. And I think that in a very real sense, one of the biggest consequences of disseminating information to everyone and having the everyman be able to promote their position, uh, either through Twitter, social media, whatever the case might be, I think the biggest drawback is that the ideas and understandings and positions that have been well-researched, well-understood, well-studied, and therefore exist as a solution unfortunately have the exact same volume in the international discourse as the ideas that are off the cuff, quick, you know, quick takes, fast takes, um, just, you know, opinions off the cuff. And because they exist side by side, I think overall when it comes to our ability to understand the world around us, we're becoming limited with the inability to, let's say, assign a genuine value to something that is more valuable than the things beside it. And I think that while we can be as well-informed as anything, given the amount of technology that we have in front of us, it's exceedingly difficult to be able to differentiate between what is truly valuable for the sake of understanding and what is valuable with respect to just opining in the public eye. Mm. And I think uh, a point you're sort of making there, like of how you're getting your information, sort of, it always depends on what your source of information is. And I think that I find big with it is that You've got your media organizations who are doing their per point for getting ratings, for getting money for the corporate bodies, because that's just what they are. And the sooner you accept that and know that, the, the easier it is for 
you and it is for everyone. But the the point I was I was chatting with someone recently about something uh, about how everyone has bias and like you know you, every there's people out there are like no I'm completely unbiased I don't think about things and ever it's like yeah you might be very low on it but you're still biased in some some minor sense somewhere so like you have one side of things who will be reporting negatively about the protests and you'll have the other side of things being the protesters saying positive things about what their action is doing it's like where is the actual middle ground there's not many times that you actually get like the middle section you're going to get one side you're going to get the other and then because of our you know internet and globalization these days you can see both and then it's up to it's sort of on you as a person to understand which side is well not which side but where the information is actually sort of slightly true on one side slightly true on the other side and then sort of filter out in the middle ground and go okay cool so this isn't a violent protest this is like yeah the newspaper's writing it's a violent protest but they stood there and they wave flags and they like knock their feet on the ground not a violent protest the police are apparently the police were arresting everyone the police arrested some dude who was being a dickhead and throwing you know throwing his body around and trying to start fights you know is there a middle ground in all that that you have to try and figure out on your own? Yeah, you do. It's a bit on each individual person to know their part of the information so they don't go in just thinking, well, this is either really bad on the right wing, this is really bad on the left wing, there's violence, there's no violence, police brutality. And in the little aspect, all of them are true, but also there are sort of, they are false as well. And then you have to figure out what is actually the truth in that, what is actually not. So it's difficult as an individual to know that. And you've, especially when it's not your country, you've got to go out of your way to figure out what the actual climate is like. And you were talking about Hong Kong before. I know I've got someone who's an Australian and recently moved to Hong Kong this year. And I don't know a lot about what's happened, but I know she's had to like stay home from work um, and things like that. And, you know, from the trains, because there was disturbances with the protests and things like that. So, you know, that is having direct effects on people's lives in the place. So obviously as an outsider, you look at it and go, well, I'm going to be avoiding Hong Kong for the next little while because, you know, you don't want to be involved or caught up or unless you obviously directly want to be, then that's your own decision. But, you know, people want to sort of try and take the safe edge, hedge their bets and take the safe option and then go from there, obviously. I mean, <clears throat> like, I mean, he, he, we can talk about sort of these bigger ideas. Um, you know, we can discuss them into the ground. And I think yeah. that one of the things that has at least become more apparent in 2019 is that, like, you know, if, if you remember the era of, like, you know, Je suis Paris... Um, yeah. and the sort of like Facebook activism around like terrorist attacks and the the uh, the Christmas market trolley incident in Germany. Yeah. Like, I, I think that to a certain extent, there is a level of impotence when it comes to being an observer, seeing something horrific, and then simultaneously understanding that as an individual, you can't help or really do much of anything to better a situation that is already chaotic, you know, uh, so nightmarish and yeah, exactly. That is just literally out of your control, especially when it comes to things like terrorist attacks. And I think that one of the, one of the biggest things that 2019 has done has been able to bring people closer to understanding their own follies where it's especially in situations of terrorist attacks you know you can't just throw money at the problem and hope that it solves itself mm -hmm. but the reason i think that 2019 has been so essential to being able to help people understand that it's not just about like throwing money at a problem or you know trying to do whatever sort of, you know, Facebook activism or just hitting a couple of likes so that 
somebody else can benefit. I think 2019 is the year where people have started to realize that there is a lot more needed to solve these global issues. How to do so isn't as clear or as you know, direct as they would like because the mechanisms by which they can sort of bring about change isn't immediately available to them. But I think at the very least, 2019 has shown the world that the world was already fucked up. We just now know how fucked up it's been. All of the cute little fucking I support this and I support that is no longer valid. Throwing money at a problem doesn't bring about any change because we know very well that you know organizations that are set up as charities so many of them are. for those that are suffering with respect to like hurricanes or whatever the money never gets to them and it doesn't actually bring about change I think 2019 if I could sum it up into a phrase is literally 2019 is the year that we figured out that we are significantly more impotent as contributors to a global society as we have ever thought ourselves to be and within that spirit I think what we can look forward to in 2020 is that people stop just talking about a problem and start doing something about it. And I think one of the one of the greatest examples that has come out of 2019 is Greta. <clears throat> the 16-year-old yep. little Swiss, Swedish girl. autistic angel. Is she Swedish? Yeah. The little exactly. Swedish autistic angel. Is she Swedish? who as a 16 year old literally just said, yo, I'm done dealing with the fluff. We need to do something about this shit and do something about it. And while like she hasn't, her, her role has been more activism and there has been, um, I, I forget the gentleman's name, but there is a particular gentleman who about a year and a half ago, two years ago, devised a way to physically remove plastic from the ocean who hasn't gotten enough um, enough praise or enough uh, awareness uh, for what he's doing in actually solving the problem. At the very least, when it comes to being a an individual contributor to the global society, Greta has kind of paved the way for us to not have to simply rely on platitudes and literally just kind of want to get down in the dirt and start trying to solve the problem for ourselves, right? This is also the year that the big trend was um, litter removal, right? The, the trash tag, right? Where people would go clean up a beach that was covered in plastic and trash, filth, and clean it up just as individuals as a part of the world to at the very least clean up what they could. And I think that this is the first step in what is hopefully something that's gonna grow where the idea of being a global citizen is no longer simply being a citizen who is conscientious of the problems that are taking place, but rather an actor in these global environments that's willing to go internationally or even just help out domestically, but for the sake beyond nationalism, beyond being American, beyond being you know a contributor to your personal local community, but understanding that every tiny little action, regardless of where you are, regardless of your country, regardless of your background, I think that in these moments, people are starting to finally realize that we're on this earth regardless of nationality and it's up to us as individuals to live our lives to take the small steps necessary to better the world at large in the long run because if we kept doing what we're doing we're fucking ourselves over we're fucking our kids over we're fucking their kids over we're fucking the economy over we're literally fucking the world over from being able to progress unless we as individuals do as much as we can with the con confines that we're limited to, but something that is 
way better than the nothingness that's been done since ni- the 1950s all the way through the early 2000s. And I think that 2019 is the turning point in a lot of beautiful things that are to come for 2020. Well, that's the positive part of it. So that's sort of the way we got to look at it is hope for the future. And I suppose we sort of don't want to get into too the nitty gritty of, you know, how it's going to happen or what it's going to happen, but sort of more of uh, looking back at, at the year. So if even if all of these things that have been so negative this year have occurred, it's sort of, can we have a, a balance out next year that means we actually have some action finally occurring. And, and if we, what you're saying hopefully comes true, then we will have a balance potentially, or we can sort of start looking at balancing out everything that is affecting what, you know, what, what everyone's globe is or flat earth. If you're an idiot, um, then we I can mean, look you, at you, to you, the... don't, you don't have to dance around it. If you're a flat earth or you're a piece of shit, <laughs> and if you killed yourself, you would save all of us a lot more aggravation. Oh, uh, God. Yeah. Um, I actually, I didn't even realize last until last night I was watching the like um, TV, watching some sport with a mate, and one of the betting companies in Australia is running ads with a flat earth. Like, the, apparently, he's the main flat earther dude, and like, it's a joke ad, but it's also like, you're a joke for being in this joke ad, you fucking moron. Like, right. Obviously, but that's also a level out. of comedy that only Australians are able to achieve. Yeah. Like, you have to think so. that, like, you know, while America is, you know, kind of like the, the home of like the entertainment industry, which is why you see, you know, a lot of American comedians going on global circuits. Well, that's personal and being choice. Very successful. Hey? Um, I mean, your your best diplomat isn't the ambassador of Australia to the United States. Your best ambassador of Australia is Jim Jeffries. Oh, he's a great. <clears throat> because I, I will say this. I think that um, when it comes to being an ambassador, you are forced to propagate an agenda that you as an individual may or may not support. I mean, uh, that's part of the reason I studied international relations and diplomacy when I went to school. And then when I realized um, that if I took the foreign officer's test to actually become a diplomat, that my job would be to promote the agenda of the United States, regardless of the president, regardless of the agenda that was being pushed forward, and I was just going to become a minion for the American government, that's immediately when I was like, well, fuck, I better find something else to do with my degree. But... When it comes to Australia, what I mean is Jim Jeffries is the greatest ambassador that you guys have had because, number one, it brought Australia to the forefront of our minds. Number two, the liberal use of the word cunt enjoyed and enriched all of our lives because we didn't know. As Americans, we didn't know that you could just casually call someone a cunt and that it would be endearing and lovely. So when I refer to you, my beautiful, wonderful co-host, James, as the best cunt, yeah, you know it's good. I mean that with warmth, depth, and understanding. Oh, and I understand of that. An entire brotherhood of <laughs> acceptance, right? Yeah, exactly. If I were to say to anyone in the states, "Oh, you know what, dude, you're my fucking best cunt," legit, probably get punched in the face. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, But, and and that's what I mean, diplomacy, it's the means by which you find that middle ground either across nations, individuals, business situations, what have you, right? And on that note of like, so you're sort of saying how like, you know, Jim Jeffries acts acts as a ambassador for Australia. Realistically, anyone who's traveling acts as an ambassador for their country, no matter where they are, it's sort of. You know, in Croatia, Australians are known for being loud, rowdy, annoying drunkards. And that's maybe, so in that part of the world, all of the travellers have provided a bad representation of the country that no matter who goes there, if, you know, a comedian, if a politician, if an actress or an actor goes there, then they're not going to be able to overcome what those previous travellers have said. So it's also part of, 
when you're looking back at your travels, you can look at back and say, did I act as a good, you know, whether you want to act as a good investor for your country is your own decision. That depends on whether you're, you know, internationalism or any of that. But did you act as a good ambassador for yourself is probably the biggest question. Um, did you represent yourself well? Did you act like a dick? You know, would you go back to that same place? And we often talk about it with Mostar, but would you, would you go back to the same place and have people be like, hey, you know, good to see you, you're back. Like, we're happy to have you back. Or would they look at you and be like, well, this dickhead's back. we have got to deal with him again or her. I will not want to do that. So it's sort of when we're talking about looking backs, you know, and doing assessment on yourself potentially, that's a big part of it of like, well, you know, how did I travel? Did I do it either sustainably? Did I do it not sustainably? Did I do it being a dick? so on and so forth. So right. and that sort I, of leads I mean, to with, our topic today pretty well. <laughs> with that in mind, I mean, you know, it, it's when you travel and, and this is something that is just generally true, um, whether or not there's, you know, you know, if you're taking a particular, let's say, well-beaten path, right? So, you, yeah. you, you know, you do the routes that are most commonly traveled by backpackers. Typically, everyone along the line um, kind of has a general understanding of, like, you know, what Americans are like, you know, what Australians are like, the British, and, you know, anyone, you know, in the middle, few and far between, right? Even, you know, the French have their reputation. And oh, don't we love the French. While they can be, you know, loose moraled and a good time um you know the french have their position in the world and the same as anybody else the germans always have the highest expectations of any place that they're at and they sometimes come across as rude because they're too direct about their expectations versus the reality of what it was to experience a hostel or place or whatever but what I'm curious about, and, and James, uh, from your perspective, what do you think it takes for someone to be genuinely representative of their country in a meaningful way um, where their imposition on any given place can actually benefit um, those that come behind them? Well, I think that depends on what you want to provide as a benefit and how you see your country. Like, I think that would change depending on your background in the country, your outlook and all the rest. If you're, and again, it's probably easiest to sort of look at it as a, um, you know, when in comparison to, the US because you've got sort of, you know, Trump supporters and similar to that. So when they're... So wait, as an Australian, how do you see Trump supporters? I mean, like, I know that they're all naive, misunderstanding sort of simpletons. And I think that the world outside has this idea that they're these sort of demons that just, you know, want to put black people in cages yeah. and enslave minorities for their own <laughs> labor purposes. Um, I but think... so like as an outsider, it is interesting, especially in this era, like how do you, as, how does an outsider really see the idea of a Trump supporter? Um, because I think it is so, a yeah. valuable idea to understand because, you know, one of the things that's been a big sort of issue with the modern administration is the inability to have a genuine international policy that would paint America in a decently positive picture, even though in all honesty, we've kind of been the devil for over three decades now. Yeah. See, I, I think I'd look at it a little bit different than most people. Um, I would look at it and say, it's a democracy, so they're entitled to their opinion. Whether or not that is what you agree with as your opinion is also your opinion. Um, I try and play the level-headed mind in politics and not get too drawn into the crap of it because there's so much crap. 
Um, right, but well, I'm, I'm just just as you as a dude, like, p- perfect example. When I was in uh, Belgrade, I ended up befriending a gentleman out of California. Um, and then as the night went on, it became uh, clear because he got drunk and put it out there that he was a Trump supporter. And we're looking at now 20, like right after 2016. So we're looking at like the tail end of the winter period of 2016. And typically when you meet somebody from California on the road. Yeah, they're not really. Your first idea is not Trump supporter, right? No. So like what I mean is, you know, it's one thing to be understanding of their position. But like as an outsider, like if you could just give us a quick take as far as what you believe to be kind of the standards and practices, so to speak, of how you are able to understand a Trump supporter? Like, what what, what does that entail for you? Again, I would look at it, yeah, again, I would look at it differently, I think, to most people. I would look at it and be like, okay, America, you've got two main parties. You've probably either grown up a Democrat, you've probably either grown up a Republican, that's the way that like your parents have probably raised you in most cases they sort of that's how politics works often you end up doing the same sort of support that your parents gave or if you've changed it's because something has affected you that's changed you to that side so then that's where that's the interesting point to me for trump supporters is are they just republican supporters who have always been republican supporters because then it doesn't really matter that they're trump supporters they've always been republican supporters yeah that's just what it is but if you if have could, changed, that's the interesting part of like what has affected your life to change you from supporting the Dems to supporting the Republicans or supporting Trump. Like, is it the charismatic, charismaticness of Trump being Trump charisma. and being out there, charisma of it? Yeah, I just went around mm. the words really badly. Or it's okay. is it a I know policy? English isn't your is first it... language? You speak Australian, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, is it a policy? <laughs> is it a um, is it a an effect of I don't know the economy or something? Or is it just the charisma that he thinks that you think he's going to change the world? I don't know. I no, can't no, answer but, those what, questions. What I'm what I'm getting what, at. But I don't, what you want to know at, what I think a standard Trump supporter is. I don't think there is a standard here, Trump supporter. If you, I don't if think you there's don't a standard wanna, If you don't want to specifically state what you think a Trump supporter is, if you could simply give the general conventions as to what Australians think trump supporters are that would be super valuable because what i'm saying is that like look it's obviously i'm liberal it's very apparent that you're liberal as well so we're very biased and we have our particular notions as to what trump supporters are but because you're australian you have a basic understanding of other australians generally considering what trump supporters are like as an american i have a very specific view that a Trump supporter is someone who is unpolitical, who is literally just an ego-driven megalomaniac who is just trying to drive somebody else's ego on issues that they don't understand, and they're trying to minimize the nuance of what the direct application of governance actually is. But that's my personal opinion. What I'm saying is that as Australians, not being American, when you encounter a Trump supporter, what are the basic things that you, I guess... If you were Expect. thinking, if you were thinking like, I don't, well, and again, this is a very outside perspective, and I wouldn't agree with it. But if you were looking at a Trump supporter, you would assume they would probably be a white person. They would more than likely be from the south, and more than likely be racist. I don't necessarily agree with and that. And what does that mean to Australians? I mean, if I'm not mistaken, and not to kind of like, I don't know, jump down your bones, but like in Australia, there there is like. The matter of racism, not in the same way that we have it with respect to whites and blacks, but mm. when it comes to the aboriginals um, and, you know, the natives, so to speak, you know, it's not as if Australia has a clean history well, when it comes to no, Australia has been as bad as relations. anywhere else. Right. So what is that? So when you when you guys think of racism, is it is it something that is traditionally viewed as you know, uh, a, a, a negative attribute and a, a, a classless and valueless position? Or, it, you know, is there 
I mean, and not to, I guess, just play devil's advocate, but, you know, it, it, is there a genuine merit to the racism in Australia that might be superior to the racism in the United States? I was having this discussion with someone, literally, like, I think Friday night, and I think I was having this discussion how, as a lot of Australians, we are, I don't know, term it, like, as something being casually racist, but more of a meaning, like, I think there is more humor to it in Australia than anywhere else in the world. There's more, um, you know, banter between, especially like at sporting clubs, if you have, you know, um, and a lot of sporting clubs are, are quite diverse in their in their ethnicity, especially, you know, like What's cricket, a sporting so, club? like, you know, a cricket club or a football club <laughs> or a, something like that. Um, like local teams. So, you know, I played a lot of cricket, you have oh, a lot of Indian right. guys, Pakistani <laughs> guys. Um, we had Japanese players. Um, everything like that. So, and there would be, you know, banter, the best term is banter between the group about, you know, you fucking white boy, go put some sunscreen on, things like that. And then uh, other things as well that I, I can never remember precisely, but me being a white boy, I go, you know, I need to put sunscreen on. So like, there's that, which I think is very casual. And I think there's no actual mean intention behind it. It's just an active joke compared to other parts of the world that I've been in where you would see the same sort of thing, but it would be intended as an insult. So it would actively, actively be like, no, you're speaking to this person in like a derogatory way. So I think that it would be meant to hurt. As it would be meant to, to hurt. Like, yeah. Right. So I think, you know, there is racism everywhere because you always have those white people who are just assholes and don't know any yeah. better. But then, you know, you also have things going back the other way where, um, you know, like I know in Japan, they don't treat foreigners very well. Um, they don't. And so, I will say this, though. I, I will say this. Um, that is true. But their means aren't malicious. Exactly. Which is so, to say yeah. that, like, and, and, and I think that this is something that is very much lost in the conversation about racism in the United States. In Japan... Uh, they aren't fond of outsiders in the same way the French aren't, but the French are just a bunch of twats. So <laughs> that's just kind of an international given. That's a different story. But the Japanese, the Japanese essentially, it is of no malice to differentiate you as an outsider. It is simply a classification. Hmm. They don't think of you as lesser nor do they think of you as mm. inhuman, as a lot of the Southern racists think of blacks as not being people or yeah. like literally consider them animals. It is a, simply a classification as to all people that are not Japanese. We have our personal culture. Yeah. It is to be treated and respected in this particular way. You as an outsider with no understanding have no knowledge of our culture and therefore you are now decidedly an outsider. outsider. Yeah. The, I think the biggest difference between Japanese racists and American racists is that while we can see it as racism from the Japanese, in reality, it's simply a position to protect the integrity of their own culture. Yeah. And in a meaningful way, which is to say to keep us from disrespecting their culture and keeping it in its own sort of incubation tube as it would be. And I think in the States, the pro like racism isn't about preserving Southern culture or preserving the American way. No, it's, personal. it's about trying to become superior yeah. to those that you keep on the outside. And I think with the Japanese, they don't assume superiority by keeping you out, but rather they would much rather you put you through the means by which you can learn and become to appreciate and respect their culture significantly more than an American racist would trying to do the same. Because I think for the Japanese, it's, it's a distinction with respect to protecting the integrity of the overall tradition. And I think that with Americans, it's a distinction trying to keep the overall integrity 
of what it is to quote unquote be white. And yeah. I think that they want to create an un, an interminable paradox so that they can, they're able to build superiority within that so that they can have a semblance of power over someone who might want to come close, participate, or be involved in their quote-unquote culture. And I think that that's where, while we can just generally cover all of it as racism, I think the nuances as to how it's applied and the intention and how and why you choose to differentiate yourself from someone else because of their race, background, ethnicity, or whatever, I think that, especially for the American conversation, those nuances don't exist. From the international perspective, especially with you being Australian, as you kind of outlined, it is racist to sort of take these things lightly. But Trevor Noah even said it, I'd rather face the devil I know than the devil that's trying to be nice to me. Yeah, and it all then just comes to malice, realistically. Exactly. So, exactly. You know, a lot of parts of the world they're not malice by it, but others are. Um, But on that note of how, you know, the Japanese keep you on the outside, maybe we need to discuss sort of like aims for responsible travel for for going forward or for 2020 at least for for starting with sort of. Yeah. How we're looking to to just to do it or how you can do it. The number one thing that we should. Number one thing we should address is that with all the chaos that's going on, that has been going on in 2019, it's going to naturally carry over in 2020. Uh, but in reality, you can't let that stop you from going to see something for yourself. While the propaganda machines might be trying to convince you that some place is more dangerous than it is, short of actually entering a war zone, you're going to be fine. Places um, have always been no... dangerous. That's the thing. Like, there's always yeah. been a level of danger and then you're just depending on the level where you whether you're talking about personal danger because there's pickpockets and you know there's some thieves around or whether there's actually armed violence occurring you know i think for the world there's and this is maybe a very big statement but we're probably in one of the eras of the least amount of armed violence occurring uh not necessarily just talking about 2020 but just you know the last 20 years, I suppose, looking at back at the last two decades, almost. I mean... There's still a lot, as, but on a world yeah, scale, I mean, there's not many Most of it's concentrated into schools in the US, yeah. so <laughs> you're not wrong. Yeah. Um, but no, I think... Um, no, it, it's... Look, so, like, the era for personal safety while traveling, I don't think has ever been higher. It's obviously, if you're going to dangerous places, you need to be smart about what you're doing and think about it. You know, you don't just walk into... Yeah, and I, I think that and be like, yeah, to, cool. but, you know. to, to what you're saying, I think that personal safety comes down to having people around you that will help navigate you through an unknown space in a meaningful way to let you be able to experience their culture and experience the locale without any real sort of question marks. And I think that because of the internet and because of where we are, just in general, when it comes to travel with, you know, cheap flights here and there, like it's never been safer because there's more people traveling and there's more people willing to genuinely connect with you as a person and help you to get to where you want to go. I think that back in the day, one of the biggest problems was people set out to an unknown place and then they didn't really have resources to be able to understand where they were, how to get around and they would just get ripped off and exactly, fucking, yeah. yeah, and just like, you know, get raped for every dollar that they had. And in some instances, depending on where they went, literally raped, um, which is something, especially in the tech era, that isn't really there. It's not present. Like, you know, by just doing a cursory Google search, what neighborhoods to avoid in any given place. Yeah. Like, uh, I know that uh, Emily, my girlfriend, um, she went to Turkey a week after the bombings back in the mid 2000s. 2016, maybe, yeah. 2016, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. I she was also there in 2016. Right there yeah. afterwards. Had a blasty. Yeah. And then, sure enough, the week after she left, there was another series of bombings. But yeah. 
in reality, like, we can demonize the world and try to create a position that justifies us staying home and staying ignorant and buying in to the propaganda that we get sold because we're the best country in the world and who the fuck would ever want to leave the U.S. But I think the only good that Trump has done has shown the American population and the world that not only has the United States been flawed, but we've gone about governance the absolute wrong way. And in his presidency, he has shown us all of the loopholes that it takes to just be rich and literally get away with murder. Hashtag Epstein did not hang himself. Hashtag what the fuck. But at the end of the day, when we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at what we want for 2020, all we want as responsible citizens of the world is to have a phenomenal experience, connect with people that will help make our life experience better, and if we have a bone of altruism in us, be able to contribute to someone else selflessly in the best way that we can. So for all the viewers and listeners out there, you're going to wonder, and we always wander far from home, but no matter how you wander, keep your wander funky. Thank you for listening. Fantastic new year to you. And we'll see you in 2020. Have a happy new year, guys.